Our panel today is going to be focused on one of the hottest topics in, uh, in the Egyptian market today, uh, which is fintech, one of the fastest growing sectors in the entrepreneurship ecosystem and the economy. And with the government of Egypt's current focus on financial inclusion and with a 67% of the adult population unbanked, and with the current initiatives of the central bank towards establishing the sandbox and establishing the fintech hub, and transforming the economy into a digitally enabled and scalable economy. Um, our panel today has a set of fantastic speakers. Everyone has experience in the fintech field, and each one of them has seen it from a different angle. So I'm going to give them all a chance to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll jump right into it. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Ahmed, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Sahar. And um, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, one of the companies in the fintech space uh, called T-Pay Mobile. And uh, um, T-Pay Mobile is, is just taking care of the one box, filling the gaps of uh, a problem related to the digital economy, to be able to have the populations of uh, Middle East and North Africa capable to, capable to transact in the M-commerce or e-commerce uh, global system, which is currently, or like used to be, uh, a limitation because of the low level of online payment penetration in our countries. So uh, T-Pay is just a payment gateway, allowing anybody, uh, any consumer, any user who has a mobile phone number identity to be able to use this phone number instead of the typical you know, like uh, methods in, as an alternative payment method to transact using his mobile number uh, in, uh, on, on the digital sites or the digital applications. So uh, very, uh, where we are, we are, we've been, st we started five years ago, very small with a dream, um, whether we can make it in terms of the potential, the potential was already there, but like we had to work with the ecosystem, everybody in the ecosystem, the telcos and uh, the merchants and the uh, uh, e-commerce side in order to make it happen. Five years ago, we uh, started with one con three countries, a very sl um, small penetration per country. As we speak now, we uh, cover uh, 18 countries in the MENA, fully covered by this payment method, meaning that all of the populations uh, in these countries can transact using this gateway on any uh, a local, international, or global uh, uh, kind of online merchants. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Matthias Lundqvist. Uh, I offer a global perspective on this panel. Uh, I am working for a company called Transfer Galaxy. We are a Swedish company. Uh, we have a platform a digital platform for cross-border payments. So what we, what we offer is to our senders can send money to their relatives uh, or family or friends in another country. So we focus on immigrants living in Europe who send money to their families living in regions such as EMEA. Uh, we started in 2014. Uh, we raised considerable amount of external financing and today we operate within 25 countries in Europe, and we send to around 25 countries in Africa and Asia. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Islam Shawi. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of PayMob. What we do at PayMob is that we build infrastructure solutions for banks and mobile network operators and merchants to allow them either disperse funds or accept funds in a digital uh, format. And actually, we work with the regulators and the central bank in order to increase financial inclusions and empower people with tools such as mobile wallets, for instance, to perform digital transactions and have better access to financial services. Uh, the company we uh, co-founded four years uh, ago uh, here on campus, actually, so it feels extremely uh, nostalgic. The six of us used to, we co-founded the company in, uh, in one of the rooms in the library where we had our first transaction and we were drawing what we we're going to do. And we can talk about this uh, in more details uh, during the panel. However, fast forward these four years, we have more than 9 million mobile wallet uh, uh, users on our different platforms that we empower. We have 
couple of thousand missions and we're doing a throughput of around 25 billion Egyptian pounds uh, per year. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Henny Slimin. Uh, a month ago, I, was, I used to wear a different hat. I used to be a part of uh, building a strategy of achieving financial inclusion in the banking industry. I used to be a banker for a long time. And uh, nowadays, uh, I decided to uh, join the entrepreneurship ecosystem. I'm uh, managing the expansion of uh, an international fintech. It's Paytabs. Uh, they're specialized into payment gateways as well. We've been in the market for the past six years, uh, serving around 40 countries. And we decided to expand our services in Egypt to be part of or to position the company as an enabler to uh, provide uh, uh, financial services for uh, merchants and to achieve or to be part of achieving financial inclusion in Egypt. Thank you. My name is Omar Saleh. I'm co-founder and CEO at Khazna. Uh, Khazna is an early stage venture focused on providing banking and financial services to the underbanked population, which is estimated to be over 20 million uh, people in Egypt. Um, what we're trying to do is to basically eliminate any face-to-face -face, uh, interaction that is required throughout the experience. So it's a full mobile-based uh, solution, and we're happy to be here with you today. All right, so uh, first things first, Henny. You, you have been on both ends, or you, or you actually you have transferred from one end to the other end of the spectrum. And as someone who spearheaded the CIB's strategy into innovation, um, recently uh, the banking industry is starting to adopt the idea of fintech. They're starting to transition themselves into experimenting with innovation, working with more fintech startups. Uh, can you tell us more about what are the major trends regarding that and what are the most important things that, uh, that the banking industry needs to digest in order to have a better adoption? Interesting. So basically, let me start. So why banks are trying to get engaged in this ecosystem? And, and I believe the entry point for all the financial industry was always the cost to serve. Now, in our country, financial inclusion became a very important aspect. And it's, it's something that not became on the top of our financial industry's agenda, but it's on the top of the government's agenda as well. So, and they're asking the financial industry to start to contribute into serving the unbanked segment and try to deliver financial services to the full population. So basically, with, with the infrastructure that we're having right now, now we're talking that we're having 39 banks, we're having around 4,000 branches, this is not enough to achieve financial inclusion. And to start investing in this to uh, avail your financial services and to make this kind of reach out, this will cost billions and billions of dollars to achieve these kind of objectives. So that was the entry point, point for banks to start engaging more into entrepreneurship ecosystem from one side and introducing innovation inside the big organization's world from the other side. And that's where I believe my previous bank was trying to step in, where they started to see how they can build a collaboration model, how they can capitalize on great minds and great ideas in the market. I believe I've been uh, a client for uh, many of, the, of my colleagues over here. I've been a client for this guy for a long time. And we used to have this kind of uh, love and hate relationship because of the, the perception from each one of us. They're very fast, they're very dynamic. We, are, uh, we have corporate governance, so uh, they are so fast to introduce their services. And we have to be very uh, cautious into how we can implement these kind of services inside our walls. But banks now are moving forward. Banks now are trying to introduce innovation in different ways. And they're trying to create uh, the right infrastructure to adopt that. Basically by uh, introducing departments that would serve this kind of objective. Innovation departments inside banks. You now see banks are part of every single accelerator and incubator program in the country. Why? They're trying to find the right capabilities, the right uh, opportunities where they can use and capitalize to expand their financial services, but not by building everything from scratch, by capitalizing on the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And that's the only way where banks and any player in the financial industry would increase the reach out and serve the financial objectives of, of uh, financial inclusion objective through our ecosystem and our infrastructure. I would like to understand from Islam, because when they founded Paymob, I'm sure that at the time that Paymob was created, there practically was no fintech strategy. 
there was no appetite towards fintech in the market. It no. was practic- it, it was a very difficult language for everybody to understand. They were so very welcomed by banks as well. Yes, they were. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we had a very warm reception from banks, of course. So I want you to picture this like. Five years ago, I had a big afro, and my colleague, my co-founder, Alan, had a ponytail, and we stepped into one of the largest and biggest public banks in Egypt, telling them that your payment gateway needs to be completely overhauled, and the pricing model doesn't work for startups, and actually, you need to uh, let us actually manage this, and we're going to do a better job than the 400, 500 people that you have uh, in your team. And actually, we were kicked out of this bank, and we went to another bank, and we had the same, uh, the same uh, welcoming uh, response. So this was the second bank. We had only four banks that we want to work with at, that have the same technology that we want to uh, integrate with. So this was the second bank. The third bank, uh, I wouldn't say its name. However, it, uh, they had the same uh, welcoming uh, reception as well. We stayed like that for almost uh, a year, trying to just land a bank. And then I heard that the CEO of Arab African International Bank is a professor uh, at AUC. He teaches Dr. Hassan Abdullah, he used to be the CEO. And then I stayed in front of his, uh, his office where he, where he had the classroom where he had to give the, the, the lecture. He actually changed it, so I had to come the other week. It took me a month in order just to meet him in order for me to pitch him for like a minute and then to have another meeting with him at the bank. From this on, it took us 14 months to launch from the day we stepped into Arab African International. So for us to launch our services, it took us more than two years just of meeting the banks and trying to convince them. I know where they're coming from because at the end of the day, they need to be cautious. They're putting their name behind you, so they need to make sure that the security is in place. Business continuity is also something that they look into uh, uh, very much. However, uh, of course, things change from now on. I think the success that uh, some of the startups back then uh, made made banks very uh, excited about it, and actually the positioning. Because at the end of the day, if you're positioning, if you're positioned that you're competing with the bank, then I don't think they are going to welcome you at the end. However, when you convince the bank that you're complementing the services, you're tapping into an untapped segment that they can't, with their uh, cost structure, as Henny was saying, can't uh, go, or with their existing technology, can't tap. This is where they get uh, excited and they want to work. And actually, uh, why we started this company is actually because we, we, we were doing an e-commerce website. Like our dream wasn't building a, a fintech company. We started as an e-commerce. However, we went into Arab African International Bank and they told us, you need to, uh, in order to have a payment gateway, you need to pay a huge sum of money. You need to integrate with a legacy system and you need to pay a maintenance fee and you know, a lot of paperwork and so forth. So we said, we thought that banking was extremely better than this. And we, we said, why don't we build a new rails, a new infrastructure for people like us? Because we found that, that everybody is suffering from this. It's not only small companies. So we said, why don't we build something for a payment gateway and a payment solution for the masses, whether from businesses or consumers, in order to increase digital acceptance. And actually, this is uh, what we've done. So I mean, as I was saying, this happened like four or five years ago, like six of us in a, in a room now. Now we're around 100 people. Uh, it took us six months to sign with one merchant, and it took us two years to sign with a bank. Now we have more than 10 banks. We operate in four countries. And as I was telling, uh, always we, uh, when we founded the company, we wanted to, be, uh, to process a percentage of the GDP. And this is actually every year when we close the year, we see how much did we process and what is the GDP of Egypt in that sense. And to see, and this is actually the competition because a lot of people would say that, what are you competing? Are you competing together? Because most of us, you'll see us overlapping. Actually, my main competitor is cash. I don't see any other competitor that big and that scary. This is what we wake up in the morning trying to eradicate, this cash and the cash mentality. And how can we make people lives better by eradicating cash uh, out of the equation? So I mean, this year, 
our target and it was met, we're going to process 0.5% of the GDP. So for every 200 pounds of goods and services that has been uh, circulated or do, uh, and counted in the GDP, we processed one pound of that. You, uh, you mentioned a, a wonderful point, actually, which is you are not, we are not competing with yeah. the banks. We are complementing the banks. So there needs to be a partnership with the banks. As well as Haney mentioned that there is a governance system within the banks and there is a legacy system within the banks. So there is always a risk and there is always an appetite that comes with the risk, which is where Omar comes in which is now there is, a, there, is a great, there is a very big opportunity in the underbanked area, which is the majority of the population. And given the risks and given the opportunity, Omar, can you tell us more about how are you de-risking this and why do you think this is a good opportunity now? I think, uh, like Islam, we are uh, in a war with cash. But unlike Islam, it took us five months to launch a product. So we're currently live. Thank God we couldn't have lasted 14 months like they did. <laughs> So we have a live product now that is serving our customer segment. So again, I guess, yeah, let me tell you real quick what the problem is, right? Like the, what the market need is. We have we're one of the few countries that has over 50% mobile phone, active smartphone and data usage, while only a third of this 50% has access to financial and banking services beyond a payroll card, okay? So our target segment is 20 million people who are actively using their smartphone at an average of eight hours per day, more than Saudi, UAE, US, and China, but they lack access to any financial and banking services. It's a great challenge. Yeah, and we wake extremely energized every day. It's significant impact. Our customers love what we're doing, right? Like, so, uh, uh, the, the need is very clear. I think your question is with regards to timing, which I, again, you know, I think we are at a historic moment in time. Uh, the problem has been there for a long time, but I think uh, since I think mid of next, last year, there's been a significant push from actually the president downwards, all the way downwards, to basically digitize payments. So the entire country, including all of us, is in a war against cash. And the reason why we started the company is we've seen not just the talk of the central bank, but actions. We've seen real actions demonstrated in new regulations, in uh, support on funding, in push of the banks. The central bank is pushing the banks very hard to work with startups, to take risk on startups uh, and work with them. Uh, so I think it's the most unique time. I think now is the right time uh, to, to join this movement, whether it's on the consumer side, like us, and serve the underbanked and the under unbanked, whether it's on the merchant side, it's, it's the right time. So I think it's very, the next, few, we're, we're extremely, extremely excited about the next few years. My recommendation, I guess, for the bank, I'm not, I don't think the banks are here, but my recommendation for the banks is to basically have, similar to their financial KPIs, is to have a strict written KPI from the board down to uh, how much work and activity they're going to do with fintechs. This is the only way it's going to happen, either mandated by the CBE or from their boards. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot of talk. We are lucky enough, we're working with one of the top banks that has shown extreme support uh, in, in working with us, and we... And we're very excited about the future. Let me comment, actually. It's a very exciting discussion from both of for them. Let me elaborate as well. The common factor between the probably mo most of the, uh, the, the companies ha who had made traction or who had changed the perceptions of the ecosystem or who had really, uh, you know, tried to build, the, uh, let's say, the collaboration in the ecosystem was like, as we speak, like it was five years ago. Five years ago, it was too tough because it was as funny as Islam is saying. You just walk in from my side. It was you walk into the operators and say, uh, can you give me access to your subscriber base? And, uh, and I, I just want to, trust me, take them. 
I want to give the, have the access and trust me, they, I, I will be able to create use cases on top of, use of, of those uh, active base. I will create for you uh, Stelcos, you know, like an, uh, a separate stream of revenues coming from uh, the first use case, which is available, the payment or digital payment on that. The, so what my idea was, either you go to every single uh, node in this ecosystem back then, banks, you know, like infrastructure, or like government uh, enabling layers, whatever. On my side, we started from another end, and I will tell you how now we are clicking together. We started from the consumer access. So we didn't start from the infrastructure enablement part. We started from, let's go directly, as Omar was saying, let's go directly, you know, about the only, the only platform who can give you access to everybody in the country, which is the telcos. Telcos ha are the only one globally, globally, you know, who can give you access to every single person in the country. And this was my dream. What do we need to do? We don't have to wait for all of the inclusion to happen. They are there. They have access to everybody of us in any country. So why not? get this access, you know, through the ecosystem to make it happen on different products, payment, digital payment, uh, financial s solutions, whatever, but you need the access first. Access is very important. So what we did is that we walked in this operators and we started, we had this like same impression, no owner, what do you want to do? Why should we give you access to our systems and billing systems and subscribers and trust you and all of this? We built all, we built it all down up to create this acceptance and create a success story that replicated across countries and make it be and, 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 and uh, you know, like made us. Uh, be uh, capable to reach this 700, we have access to 700 million, 700 million users in Maya, 700. Who else in the world, you know, can give you access to 700 million users? So this is a very important, you know, like say, breakthrough as a starting point, which can enable lots of the stories that is happening in the ecosystem. Ecosystem is very, you know, like the, the, it's a beautiful time. The second point I say, it is the right time. Now that the acceptance has happened, everybody is collaborating. So imagine that, that, that there is endless possibility where we can transform, transform the experiences, transform the economy, transform and accelerate the targets, uh, not relying only on the typical uh, players, like for example, everybody was saying financial inclusion will never happen except from banks and financial institutions. So actually, this was completely, completely proved that it's not achievable. So all of these uh, uh, players now are collaborating together, each with a certain positioning and a certain uh, value proposition. And in my opinion, it's, it's a very nice, uh, you know, age because collaboration happened. Now we sit with everybody in the room and they don't look at you and say, you're my competitor, what do you want to do? Or like, because uh, at the end, we discovered that what we built on the consumer side is usable, is of value to, uh, to, to unlock the targets of all of the rest of the players in the ecosystem in a way. So I think uh, now the matrix of possibilities for all of us is just multiplied by, you know, endless uh, uh, kind of scenarios. And, and this is why it's very exciting and, 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 and to, to tell you that we're working with everybody on this. We, can, we, we are working with most of the people on this panel. We're working with the ecosystem of the... Uh, financial institutions on and and we're working with the ecosystem of the legacy and the international because there is always something that we can enable together or accelerate it together in a way so this is uh, how uh, you know exciting it is currently working um, um, five years down the road which was completely dark five years ago you know <laughs> yeah you know whenever from even the co-players in the same ecosystem yeah Oh, this is my comment. Matthias, can you tell us more about how, what, where is the link between the markets that you operate in? It seems that you are present in a multitude of markets and the Egyptian market. 
Well, I think what we're seeing here in the Egyptian market is what we have seen in Europe. You t- we're talking about how we need to build on the banks and try to convince the banks that they need to make their platforms accessible. This is exactly what's happening in Europe now. We have, from a legislative pers- perspective, we have the uh, second payment service directive, uh, PSD2. We have a lot of open banking initiatives. Uh, but we also see that coming from the banks themselves because they realize in order to to grow going forward, they can't do that thems- themselves. They are not the quick organization as you are, you know, and, and five months to launch a product. They, they would never launch a product within five months, right? Um, so the banks need to understand that themselves, and they are starting to do that. And I'm very happy that's happening here as well. But someone told me that Amazon doesn't only sell its own goods. Uber doesn't own any, any, any taxi cars. Uh, Airbnb doesn't own any apartments. So banks, they don't need to do everything themselves. They should be platforms. Mm-hmm. You know, the only opportunity to, to create this innovation is for them to open up. Of course, technology had helped a lot, you know, like we wouldn't dream of the possibilities of, uh, of anything, of openness or like collaboration or like platform, uh, you know, like kind of uh, possibilities only because of the technologies only. And actually the term fintech did not exist five years ago when we started. I mean, this is a very new terminology, you know, like, uh, yes, everybody here is now, you know, seen as fintech player, but tech is basically why all of this is happening and why all of this is possible and feasible. Uh, so technology had is an, it just like had, had made a dream come true, true in a way. And the next was the acceptance and the support and of the ecosystem players, which is happening as we speak now. So, yeah. From our perspective as an accelerator, we have invested in over 800 startups. At least 250 of them are in fintech and insurance. And as, as acceleration people, we always find ourselves in an argument of whether it's the chicken or the egg with fintech startups at their early stages usually. And it's the question of the POC, the proof of concept. So many fintech startups, they enter the programs with an ambition that they will not launch in the market unless they integrate with a bank. While on our end, we always adopt the argument of build the customer experience, access the, uh, ac- access the customer segment, show them the use case, and they will support you to integrate. But there is so much time that is being spent on the argument and not execution. So, so many fintech startups end up failing and so many accelerators waste their money. So, I would, I would like to keep this, to, to, to have this as an open discussion and I would like to hear your perspectives on the matter. Listen, uh, fintech ultimately is a highly regulated industry for a very good reason, right? Ultimately, you are serving consumers or serving merchants who are not highly educated about financial products. There's a very important role of the regulator before anything else to protect the consumer, okay? And if anyone is interested, go check out the Central Bank's directive of February 2019 in terms of consumer protection. It's one of the best global directive on consumer protection out of Egypt, out of the Central Bank of Egypt, okay? This is the first point. You need to know what is allowed, what is not allowed. There are many, there are several startups and companies that have gone beyond the POC thing. Some people are interested in starting their own thing very early on. Some others are happy to join. I think the point is, what I'm trying to make, you don't have to start yourself. Just look around you, around in the fintech ecosystem, who has maybe delivered the POC, who has started operating with a few customers, etc and approach them. Honestly, this is a unique timing for all the talent to start exploring and joining fintechs. A year from now, it will be too late. So my, this is a call to action to all of you guys to start exploring the fintech space right now, not in a year's time. Right? There's a very important aspect that any fintech has taken into consideration is to have the financial literacy. So Omar was mentioning about the guidelines being rolled out. A lot of fintechs that we used to meet, they have no idea what sort of regulations are in the market. They have an idea that they fall in love with and they see that they're going to change the market. However, they don't know if this idea would be complied with the regulations in the market or not. Whether even if you want to disrupt the regulations, that's not, that's not something bad, but you have to even to do it in the right way. You have to collaborate and to start uh, lobbying more with regulators and 
industries, uh, several industries, to see how you can uh, really bridge the gap in something that might be uh, very demanded in, in this market. And, and the other thing is that the collaboration is very important, something that Sahar just mentioned, the, the accessibility. So now financial services is not going to be limited only for the financial industry. In no time, you can see now a lot of financial services been provided by a lot of other sector players. So banks will be only the back end for all these kind of initiatives and uh, solutions will be in the market. FinTech need to take this into consideration. They need to bear in mind that not because they're in the fintech space, that means that they can have they have to come up with a loan or a new card or a new wallet, which is actually the trend that we're seeing now right now. They can come up with a lot of things that would facilitate financial services for necessities that the unbanked or any customer or underbanked will be expecting and will be looking for. Financial inclusion will not gonna be uh, fulfilled by introducing new loans and new liabilities and, and accounts and cards. Financial inclusion will be a achieved by tackling real necessities that people are looking for and supported by financial services to make them to, uh, to make it affordable for them. That's, that's what FinTech need to take in mind or to bear in mind. Now, now it's easier even than before. The use cases, the consumer end, the market needs is the product. Guys, I mean, we don't need an extra wallet and an extra, I don't know, card and an extra whatever. This is not, we are beyond this point. We need to understand how to achieve the need of the consumer in a way that is efficient. Leveraging on whatever flow. So you have to unlock what, why didn't work, what is needed to make a wallet work or to make a card work or to make a, I don't know, like any, uh, any uh, let's say, a fund, fund, access to fund, how to, it's, it's all about financial, you know, like FinTech is, you know, like financial inclusion means what? Is basically to have access to funds, basically, and to have it whenever you need it, and to have it in the context of that is implied by the consumer and the mandates and the, and the market. If you don't understand how to streamline and work with all of the stages of this uh, challenge, then you will never achieve. You will never achieve uh, uh, enough uh, proof of concept results in order to really take it to the next steps. So you cannot start only from the access to funds uh, story or the banks or the technology or the method start from the product proposition to the market and then take it down to the access point. And uh, so this is basically what we need now. We don't need extra technologies or extra containers. So this is my opinion. But I mean the idea, 100%, 100%. The idea there is that five years ago, we had a problem with the infrastructure. A lot of the use cases that Zahar and Omar was talking about weren't possible without the rail, the new rails aside from the legacy rails that we have. And I think we were a player that we were working with the central bank and the ecosystem in order to improve these rails over the course of the last three years. And I think I'm 100% with Omar that now is the time 100% because now you have the rails, you have the access. Can you imagine in Egypt there are f around 50 million people that are actually either unbanked or underserved because not anyone who has a bank account is a, someone who, who has service from the banks because you have 50 million people and all of them they have either a feature phone or a smartphone they have access with the operator and they are in need for insurance they need savings they need a payday loan or they need to buy something so the, the use cases are endless 100% and I want also to mention something that is now uh, the uh, central bank is focusing on, which is the microfinance industry. Here in Egypt, we have in excess of 3 million beneficiaries from microfinance institutions. The interesting thing is that more than 60% are women. And this is something that we didn't know. So we have in excess of 1.5 million business women in Egypt who have approached microfinance institutions to take a loan starting from 500 pounds to 100,000 pounds. Actually, this made it for us very interesting. So that's why we wanted to partner with, uh, we had a fantastic partnership with the AOF, Arab Women Enterprise Fund, on how can we actually increase financial literacy and how can we actually uh, go there and empower 
those uh, uh, benefic women beneficiaries with tools in order to perform digital transactions, in order to have a wallet, in order to have on the go, in order so that they can uh, get a loan on the go, increase their working uh, capital finance, in order to increase uh, their businesses. And as you were mentioning, it's all about the use case. It's all about the need. Yes. Nobody is going to uh, have a wallet or use any of us just because they want to go digital. It is very interesting, solving yes. an e Islam, solving a need. Who, who did make a study or like did look and say the opportunity that he's, 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 he's just discovered, you know, like uh, uh, we have an opportunity with the, you know, like the inclusion of women uh, in the economy of Egypt, actually, in creating the economy, steering the economy of Egypt. Of Egypt. There is an interesting uh, study of IFC saying that if we include you know, like more women into the into the economy of Egypt, we can boost over five years the GDP, or like we can increase the GDP 30 percent only by include 30 percent only by included the non-included, you know, women in in the economy. Access to funds is nice, but like the pace of the ecosystem before compared to the digital platforms that we are all creating is on time, whenever we need it real time and the when I need the fund, how I move it along this ecosystem, how fast I move it along this ecosystem to, because uh, you know like everybody saying, okay, we'll create a wallet. I don't care about how many wallets or how many cards, how many how many transactions go through this ecosystem. This is all the case. Whenever you have actual need, an actual ecosystem to streamline these transactions across because the trigger of the need is always there. Focus on the need, discover it, because there are a lot of potential, discover it, and then you need to uh, put in the ecosystem whatever is needed to streamline this use case as fast as possible, create transactions, create growth, and that's it. There are so many other, you know, insurance and, you know, like microfinance and, and like, all of all of the stuff that are they are all consumer and products consumer and products not infrastructure products right. and i think the infrastructure now is not mature but at least it's there to have the access solved and to have now we're integrating all this ecosystem to, and to have the flow of things moving across whatever this infrastructure is happening. Right. And this is the unlocking of the possibilities that I'm, we're talking about. Yeah? I'll, I'll and not in Egypt, across, by the way, and I will talk about cross borders as well. Yeah? yeah. Now we're having almost 13 or 14 million wallets in the country. And that's actually equivalent to the number of accounts that we had 100 years back. So actually, in 100 years, we had like 15 million accounts. Now we're having 14 million wallets in three or four years. But let's talk about the activity of the wallets in the market. It's actually minimal. It doesn't go beyond 5%. Why? They're not tackling yet the right use cases. It's all about P2P and bill payment. Still, there's many, many use cases that you can introduce using such infrastructure and tackle the real need that people will be expecting out of those uh, wallets and out of this infrastructure. So all of these pillars that creates good channels where you can interfere and you can enter the market and provide other uh, solutions that would be adding a lot of value in the market as well. It's a very basic uh, piece of information, but if we go on the Central Bank of Egypt's FinTech Egypt website, you will, get, you will easily find access to the three major pillars that the Central Bank is focusing on for financial inclusion, and you will find over 40 to 45 problem statements that have been created in conjunction with all the in conjunction with a multitude of different players in the fintech ecosystem in Egypt when everybody came together we were able to produce over 40 problem statements that the central bank has signed off and has uploaded on a website publicly for anyone to see and to understand where the financial inclusion strategy is going and if you take a look at the problem statements it's exactly what Sahar and Haney and practically anybody, everybody on the panel is saying. Most of the problem statements are not focused on a product and they are not focused on a technology, but they are focused on customer segments. They all tackle customer segments and they all tackle a subject matter. They all tackle a problem that exists in the market that requires reach and requires the right distribution channel or access to the customer segment. So the reason I'm saying this is that the information is available, the appetite exists, 
and with the many initiatives that have been taken, um, today the Egyptian economy is moving in a better direction. The, 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 the initiatives that have, that have been taken, especially regarding at well this, as, as well the sandbox, now there are three regulators working together, trying to make it easier for everyone to operate. And with establishing, a, with establishing a hub that is going to house everyone in the same ecosystem to collaborate together, this is a sign that the economy is moving forward. Even with the new national payment scheme, the MISA payment scheme, this will activate so many opportunities and will make so many things easier. And it actually has the potential for interoperability, which does not exist in so many markets as well. My name is Sharif Riz. I'm a consultant at PricewaterhouseCoopers. My question would be to all of you, in terms of fintech five years from now or two or three years from now, do you see telcos and MNOs as, as partnerships? They're, they're, or is it going to be uh, competitors to you guys? Um, I see a lot of them going into insure tech, maybe payment gateways. So well, what do you think from your perspective? Of course, we see them as partners because at the end of the day, as Sahar was saying, telcos, they have the access. So without this access, you wouldn't, you can't have the amount like Vodafone, for example, they have an excess of 40 million subscribers. So for a company to go and activate more than 40 million people, it's going to be huge. Even on the enterprise side, they have more than 300, 350,000 enterprises across the Soho SMEs and large corps. So for us, we have managed to find a way in order to partner with, with telecos once from the infrastructure, how to enable them technically to uh, launch their mobile money uh, programs. And as our, my fellow panelists were saying, the use cases. So for example, you have a wallet. What am I going to do with the wallet? We managed to like, work with a company, with a ride hailing, with Kareem, for example, in order to make them use the wallet, in order to do the payouts for their captains on the wallet. So the wallet in itself is just a piece of tech that has no meaning. It's just a stored value account. But when you create the use case, when you solve the problem, you will find this, uh, you will find this inclusion happening. Telecos and banks are going to stay. I don't think they're going anywhere. However, as Henny was saying, I believe they're going to become enablers, whether uh, working with fintechs on technology partnerships, on, on enablement and launching of use cases to, door, to, those, uh, to their subscription base. Five years ago, everybody was cautious, like uh, the world, uh, the two industries, like financial, typical financial institutions and the uh, telcos. They, they all, even whenever we started this, uh, you know, like mobile money kind of uh, initiatives, it was very hard for everybody to find a position to add in this ecosystem. What had happened now, I'll tell you two, two sto real stories. Even the big ones, like the switches and the international player, like even the, the Visa and MasterCard and the, and the local switches and the initial, all of those. Who can activate, who can sell and activate any of their products, let's say uh, whatever is the product, uh, whether it is a payment product or like whether it is a other like a solution, okay? Who can give them access to the dish consumer sitting digitally on the platforms in the ecosystem of the online and the, and, and the real time and the platform led kind of uh, uh, behaviors and needs, mandates of those. Who else other than platforms? Platforms, OTTs, and all of the success stories that happen even in the, you know, like Far East in the China side, and why they managed to unlock this. Get the, user, uh, uh, the users on these platforms can activate 5,000, in Egypt, we can activate 5 to 10,000, 5 to 10,000 uh, uh, products to the consumers per day. All of these fintech institutions that, that they are happy to do a sales of 400 new cards per, I don't know, months or queue or a year, 500. Look at the scale of possibilities of access and reach and activation. Pure financial products now are being activated using telcos in, in, in Egypt and in, in some other countries. So uh, I think um, it's a nice, it's, a, it's, it's a, again, it's a very beautiful time to really work together. The future will never happen except through collaboration. This is my opinion. In the next five years, 
the age is only for platforms, 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 platforms. It's not only for the infrastructure game. So everybody has to play a, play a role on the consumer end, play a role on the infrastructure and, and on the regulations and, and on the uh, ecosystem of the global e-commerce. Because uh, if you want to have uh, access, if you want to have users in Egypt to have access to the international e-commerce sites and be capable to really uh, uh, transact on on the on them, then you need to do much better job than the current job of the financial institutions that that that, that, that have done whatever they've done in the last 20 years, uh, and still uh, populations of Egypt cannot do what they need to do now to launch their. Uh, campaigns in the digital world, in the Facebook, in for their products and startups and and all of this, and this is uh, this is you know like uh, barrier barrier of growth of startups of the economy itself. So it's about enablement, and enablement cannot happen except if you accept that is going to do to be done on the dis in the digital way in the digital age on the platform way with the collaboration and technology has made it possible, fully possible. I think in five years time, the role of uh, branch based banking and financial services will be much smaller, much, much smaller. Uh, it will be replaced uh, largely by artificial intelligence. Uh, I also think that in five years time, we will have at least one Egyptian FinTech unicorn and at least five Egyptian fintechs that are valued at over $100 million. Converting the way how financial services have been rolled out in a conventional way that we all are witnessing right now to go into an uh, innovative and very radical in the market, it, it will always happen by uh, capitalizing on data and it will be more data driven. And data to be data driven and to be behavior driven it will not come from the financial industry. It will come from someone that has this kind of reach out. And I believe MNOs are the only uh, industry or sector that had this kind of reach out to everyone in the country. So based on this kind of behavior, based on this kind of data that they're collecting, they can easily provide through other players a lot of financial services and a lot of financial, uh, or serve a lot of financial needs in the market. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.